the neck, it should intersect the epiphysis in a normal side. On the left side, you can see that it is not intersecting. And you can see that there is mild slippage of the proximal femoral epiphysis with an angle of about 30 degrees. So what all are, are these angles? So how do you classify a child with SCFE? So the, so the classification, there are three. One is a temporal classification. So you have pre-slip where it is uh, just widening and irregularity of the physis. Acute slip which is less than three weeks. A chronic slip where it is, the symptoms are more than three weeks. And the commonest scenario which is an acute on chronic slip where the child has symptoms since more than three weeks has a sudden fall, trips, and then comes with an acute episode. This classification, however, does not predict the risk of AVN. So what does predict the risk of AVN is a classification given by this person, Dr. Randall Roder, which is a functional classification. It is either stable, where the child is able to bear weight with or without support, or unstable, where he is unable to bear weight. This predicts AVN. Because in stable slips, the risk of AVN is only about 1%, while in unstable slips, the risk of AVN is almost 50 to 60%. The next classification is a severity classification where it is described by Southwick, where the slip angle, if it is less than 30%, it is less, uh, 30, 30 it is uh, mild, 30 to 60 is moderate, and more than 60 is severe. So, why do these X ray findings lead to such gait and clinical abnormalities? So if you have the slip like this, uh, proximal femur like this, remember that there is this posterior vasculature of the femoral head which is most important. What happens in the in SCFE is that the proximal femoral metaphysis goes anteriorly, the epiphysis goes posteriorly, it is a slow process, hence there is a lot of callus here. The, the metaphysis cannot internally rotate, so it is in an external rotation deformity and that is what is portrayed by the outgoing gate. What happens when a similar hip pathology progresses further? This is a second case of a 12 year old boy with a left hip pain since 6 months and right hip pain since 3 months. This has been progressing since a long time and the gait abnormality is increasing over time. He is unable to squat and has significant difficulty in sitting cross legs. So he now has significant issues with activities of daily living. And this is the child as you can see that he has severe symptoms, he is walking with significant bilateral outtoing, also has significant Trendelenburg gait. And if you can see from the side, you can see that his hip flexion also is significantly restricted. So this is what happens when the slip starts progressing even more. So this is an outtoing gait with a Trendelenburg gait. And on clinical examination, you can see that there is an external rotation deformity which is more on the left side. And the flexion is restricted only to about 20 degrees. So he is unable to flex more than 20 degrees on the left side and the right is barely able to flex about 80 to 90 degrees. And this is borne out by the X-ray finding. You can see that on the left side, it is a very severe slip. While on the right side, there is a mild to moderate slip. So again, why do these X-ray findings lead to such gait and clinical abnormalities? Well, if you see again this slip, you have callus and then it slips further. This is a slow process, so the callus starts organizing into a deformity and because of this bump, as you flex the hip, there is significant uh, impingement on the acetabulum and which leads to restricted flexion. There is significant overriding of the greater trochanter and that leads to shortening of the abductors and that leads to the abductor lurch. And that is manifested by the Trendelenburg gait. So thus a chronic, stable, severe slip. Remember, it's a stable slip because he is able to walk. In an unstable slip, he is not able to walk. So it's a chronic, stable, severe slip where he has an outgoing gait with Trendelenburg gait. So what are the options to treat SCFE? So broadly, these are these four options. I will go through each of them in brief. The commonest is in situ pinning. So what is in situ pinning? It really means in situ. There is no attempt made to reduce the hip. So irrespective of the deformity, you just fix it in situ. Now you remember that this slip has a significant posterior displacement. So the entry point for this screw is a very anterior entry point. So you have to be really careful in passing this screw. 
this is the this is the example where you can see that it's a mild slip and there is no attempt made at reduction and the screw fixation is done remember that the vasculature of the femoral head is posterior so if you try to reduce it closed or you forcibly reduce it then it can lead to in iatrogenic uh, uh, avascular necrosis so in situ is still the gold standard for mild to moderate slips it is a percutaneous technique and usually the here the goal is prevention of further slip this is a landmark paper which was which was written by the Ponsetti group where they showed a 30 year follow up that time it was a very good result but now we know in our, with our concept that this result which was shown as a good result now has a severe cam deformity which can lead to early arthritis usually in a stable slip just a single screw is enough two screws may be required for unstable slips is there any role for acute reduction and then pinning? Well, there is a method known as a PASH method where you do an anterior capsulotomy, put a small periostem and just try to reduce it. However, that reduction has to be till the level of the acute episode. So what does that mean? So if you have again this slip which has become an acute on chronic slip, you bring it only till the level of chronicity. You do not attempt excellent reduction in the slip and then fix it in that chronic position. So this is a clinical example. It is brought out to the level of the chronicity and not to a perfect reduction and then it is fixed. Second is you fix it in C2 and do a mini open anterior release with a burring so as to remove that anterior bump. So this method is known as in C2 pinning with an anterior osteoplasty. The third method is what was traditionally done. You go anteriorly remove this bump from anterior, remove the callus, shorten the neck and fix it with a screw. Now this is known as an anterior approach done or cuneiform osteotomy. Here the problem was that is if you are going anteriorly you don't have access to the posterior vasculature and that can have a high chance of avascular necrosis. This was first described by Dunn and Fish in the 1960s in their series, they showed a very low rate of AVM. However, over the years, it has been found by various authors that their rate of AVM with the anterior done osteotomy is very high. So what should now be done? Well, the next evolution is what was described by Reinhard Bayer Gans in 2001 as the safe surgical dislocation method. And this was modified at where the, the done procedure was added to the safe surgical dislocation method into something known as a modified done method. So what does that mean? So you go laterally, you do a trochanteric osteotomy, which is a diagastric osteotomy, you dislocate the femoral head, you create a retinacular flap where you are protecting the posterior vasculature, remove the callus, shorten the head mildly, fix it with a screw and wire, re 